Hello dear students, I am Dr. Iram Khan from CIET and CRT. In the second part of the topic of sexual reproduction in flowering plants under the unit reproduction, we will cover the structure and development of the megasporangium or the ovule and the embryo sac along with its types. In the first part of this chapter, we have already discussed the flower as a reproductive structure of angiosperms. The male and female parts of the flower the structure and development of microsporangia and the pollen grain which represent the male reproductive part of the flower. We close the first episode with some points to think about. I am sure that you all must have thought about them. Let us discuss them first. The first point was why the exine of the pollen grain is too hard. The reason of this is that the exine which is the outermost layer of the pollen grains is made up of a complex substance called sporopollenin. This substance is one of the most hard material known to human beings. It is resistant to decay. That is why pollen grains are well preserved in fossils. No enzyme that can degrade sporopollenin is known to us. Now a question appears that how can a pollen grain germinate with such a hard outer wall? The answer is that for this pollen grain exine has prominent apertures called germ pores where sporopollenin is absent. The germination takes place through these germ pores. Nature has made the exine so hard because in the process of pollination the pollen grains have to travel a long distance and face various harsh situations. The hard outer covering helps to keep the germinal material safe before reaching its destination on the stigma. Now, let us take the next point which was posed for thinking. It was, what is cryopreservation? Why do we use this procedure? Students, cryopreservation is a process where cells, whole tissues or any other substances susceptible to damage caused by chemical reactivity or time are preserved by cooling to sub-zero temperatures. At low enough temperatures, any enzymatic or chemical activity which might cause damage to the material in question is effectively stopped. Cryopreservation is done at around minus 136 degree centigrade to minus 196 degree centigrade of temperature. The preserved substances through this process are used afterwards whenever required. So dear students, now let us start with the next part of the topic, sexual reproduction in plants. First of all, let us discuss about the pistil. The gynoecium represents the female reproductive part of the flower. When the gynoecium consists of a single pistil or carpel, it is called monocarpillary. When it have more than one pistil or carpels, it is called multicarpillary. When there are more than one carpels, the pistils may be fused together and called as syncarpus, as shown in this diagram of the multicarpillary and syncarpus pistil of Pepever. On the other hand, the multicarpillary pistil may be free and called as epocarpus, as shown in the diagram of multicarpillary and epocarpus gynoecium of Michela plant. Each pistil has three parts the stigma, style and ovary. We can observe the pistil of a hibiscus flower in this diagram where all the other floral parts are removed. In the pistil, the stigma serves as a landing platform for pollen grains. The style is the elongated slender part beneath the stigma. The basal bulged part of the pistil is the ovary. Inside the ovary, is the ovarian cavity which is also called the locule. The placenta is located inside the ovarian cavity. There are various types of placentation found in different species of plants. Arising from the placenta are the megasporangia which are commonly called ovules. The number of ovules in an ovary may be one as found in wheat, paddy, mango etc and can be many as found in papaya, watermelon, orchids etc. Now let us familiarize ourselves 
with the structure of a typical angiosperm ovule. The ovule is a small structure attached to the placenta by means of a stalk called funicle. The body of the ovule fuses with funicle in the region called hilum. Thus, hilum represents the junction between ovule and funicle. Each ovule has one or two protective envelopes called integuments. The parenchymatous tissue inside the ovule is called the nucellus. Integuments encircle the nucellus except at the tip where a small opening called the micropyle is organized. Opposite the micropylar end is the chalaza representing the basal part of the ovule. Cells of the nucellus have abundant reserve food material. The embryo sac or female gametophyte is located in the nucellus. An ovule generally has a single embryo sac formed from a megaspore through reduction division. So students, as we have gone through the structure of the megaspore or the ovule, now let us discuss the process of megasporogenesis. The process of formation of megaspores from the megaspore mother cell is called megasporogenesis. Generally, ovules differentiate into a single megaspore mother cell in the micropylar region of the nucellus. It is a large cell containing dense cytoplasm and a prominent nucleus. The megaspore mother cell undergoes meiotic division. Meiosis results in the production of four megaspores. We can observe the parts of the ovule showing a large megaspore mother cell, a dyad and a tetrad of megaspore in these diagrams. Students, let us discuss about the female gametophyte. In a majority of flowering plants, out of the four, one of the megaspore is functional, while the other three degenerate. Only the functional megaspore develops into the female gametophyte or the embryo sac. The method of embryo sac formation from a single megaspore is termed as monosporic development. Let us study the formation of the embryo sac in a little more detail. The nucleus of the functional megaspore divides mitotically to form two nuclei which move to the opposite poles, forming the two nucleate embryo sac. Two more sequential mitotic nuclear divisions result in the formation of four nucleate and later the eight nucleate stages of the embryo sac. The two, four and eight nucleate stages of embryo sac and a mature embryo sac can be observed in these diagrams. Students, it is interesting to note that these mitotic divisions are strictly free nuclear, which means Nuclear divisions are not followed immediately by cell wall formation. After the eight nucleate stage, cell walls are laid down, leading to the organization of the typical female gametophyte or embryo sac. The distribution of cells inside the embryo sac in the diagram of mature embryo sac. Six of the eight nuclei are surrounded by cell walls and organized into cells. The remaining two nuclei called polar nuclei are situated below the egg apparatus in the large central cell. There is a characteristic distribution of the cells within the embryo sac. Three cells are grouped together at the micropylar end and constitute the egg apparatus. The egg apparatus in turn consists of two synergids and one egg cell. The synergids have special cellular thickenings at the micropylar tip called filiform apparatus, which play an important role in guiding the pollen tubes into the synergid. Three cells are at the chalazal end and are called the antipodals. The large central cell has two polar nuclei Thus, a typical angiosperm embryo sac at maturity, though eight nucleate, is seven-celled. 
the eight nucleate embryo sac development was first studied in polygonum. Hence, it is also called polygonum type embryo sac. Students, we can observe that at maturity, the female gametophyte or embryo sac almost fills the ovule and the nucellus is almost used by the embryo sac. A fully developed embryo sac with the nucellus, integuments and funiculus together constitute the mature ovule. Now, let us see the types of embryo sac. Students, here we should mention the name of Dr. Panchanan Maheshwari, who is also considered as father of angiosperm embryology in India. He has classified the female gametophytes of flowering plants into three main types. This classification is on the basis of the number of megaspore nuclei taking part in the development. The types of embryo sacs are, first one is monosporic embryo sac, the second is bisporic embryo sac and the third is tetrasporic embryo sac. So friends, with this we have come to the end of the second part of this lesson on sexual reproduction of flowering plants. Here we have discussed the structure and development of the megasporangium or the ovules and the embryo sac along with its types. In the next episode, we will focus on the process of pollination and its kinds, pollen pistil interaction and artificial hybridization. The point for thinking for this part of the lesson is, which part of the gynoecium develop into fruit and seeds? We will discuss this point in the next part of the program. With this, I conclude this episode. Thank you.